Welcome to Six Steps to Growing a Winning Business Seminar. As Action Coach Business Coaches, we understand that successful business ownership requires continuous training, planning, tested marketing strategies, systems, and more. That's where we come in as your partner. Action Coach has nearly 1,000 franchises in over 50 countries, and over the past 21 years, we've perfected the system we are about to show you. In fact, we are so confident in our ability to get you results, we guarantee to pay for ourselves within only 17 weeks of working with us. This one-hour seminar will show you a proven formula for how we will grow your business and help you create massive improvements to your business and your life. Your presenter today is the founder and chairman of Action Coach, Brad Sugars, the world's number one business coach. Hi, everybody. Can I, can I just start by finding out how many of you are business owners here in the room already? Where are the business owners? Can I just see a show of hands? Fantastic. Where are those of you who work for someone else? Where are you guys sitting? Fantastic. Good to see. Um, any business owners that wish you still work for someone else? Any in that category in the room? It's like, I, I don't know what's worse, whether you laugh at that joke or whether you raise your hand. It's like, you know, being in business is a tough gig sometimes. It's one of the loneliest jobs there is. Um, so I want to first of all thank you for coming out and having a chat with us here today. You know, finding out about what business coaching is and how to grow your business. There's six steps to growing your business that we teach at Action Coach. And we find that by doing it this way, a systematic methodology, which by the way, we've been doing now for 21 years with tens of thousands of companies in 53 countries. I started out a little bit more in my background. I started out in business at age 15. Anyone have a paper delivery route or sell a newspaper when you're a kid? Thank you. A couple of you did that. Well, that was my first business. And so here I was running the business. I had people delivering the papers and you know, it was only because it was so cold in the morning, I didn't actually want to get up and deliver the newspapers. But ultimately, since then, we've owned and operated dozens of different companies, everything from magazine publishing to uh, motorhomes and RVs, musical production companies. I started out as an accountant. Any, any accountants in the room? Thanks for admitting to that in public. It's not something you often want to do. See, being an accountant, guess what you learn? How to count other people's money. My job as a business coach is not about counting other people's money, it's about helping other people make a lot of money, helping you as business owners improve your business so you can work less and make more, which ultimately seems too good to be true. The reality would be it is too good to be true if we hadn't done it with tens of thousands of businesses around the world. So this system is not something that's based on theory. This is based on me. See, all I've done all my life is buy broken companies and fix them. Nowadays, I've written 15 books on how I do that. Nowadays, I've spoken in countries that I couldn't, you know, I can't even speak the language, yet they translate for me. It's phenomenal. Our books are sold. I still remember getting people from Nigeria writing referrals about my books and stuff and thinking, well, that's phenomenal. That we're helping businesses grow in all of these places. Just a little bit about how I started started with this. You see, when I first started business coaching, it was because I found out why the, well, even further back than that, my customers in one of my businesses kept disappearing. Now, they were all business owners, and I was thinking, why are my customers not coming back and buying from me? So I started calling them, and guess what I found out? They weren't there anymore. They weren't even in business. Subsequently, what I've learned over the years is that 80% of businesses fail, and so many of them do it in the first year or two years, to the point where now it became my absolute passion and desire to change the way business operates, to change what happens. Because when you understand how many businesses go bankrupt on a day-to-day -day basis, how many business owners are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis, to even, make the, to, to even pay the wage of their staff to make payroll each month, it's killing a lot of business people. And so that became my passion. And so for the last 20 years, I've traveled the world teaching people how to run their business to the point where now we have governments paying us to help grow companies because we can get more jobs happening. These are the things we do, and it's why I love what I do. It's why I started this company, and it's probably why you're all here, because you, you started your business for a reason. I'm not sure what it was. Maybe it was a better lifestyle. Maybe it was to be your own boss. Maybe Maybe it was more money, maybe to spend more time with your family. Whatever it is, 
Let's take a look at how we actually do that. So building a business is pretty simple, but to do it, we got to follow a simple set of six steps. So you ready to learn the six steps? Say yeah. yeah. It's a very simple thing to do, but we got to start right here. What is a business? By definition, most people understand a business wrong. Most people think a business is like creating a job for yourself. It's not about you being busy. Business is not spelt with a Y. What it's all about is creating a very simple thing, a commercial commercial, profitable enterprise. Now add these two parts to it, and this is where most people fall down. That works without me. If I've got to be there, it's no longer a business, it's a job for me. My goal is to create a business that works so I don't have to. See, the reason most business people, the reason you work so hard is that your business doesn't work, you do. Ultimately, if I said to you, how are you going to take another four weeks vacation? How are you going to do this? How are you going to set your business up so that it allows you to do that, so it allows you the freedom? Most business owners end up in the exact opposite scenario. They end up trapped by their business. They end up stuck in their business. They end up having to work harder than all of their employees for less money than their employees. And that's craziness in what we see. The way we teach it at Action Coach, the whole aim of this is to get the business to work so you don't have to. See, if I could reduce your hours each week, if I could cut back the number of hours that you are actually working, would that be a good thing? Yes or no? Yes. How much would you want to cut it back? And that's an interesting point. Do you know how many hours a day or week you actually want to work? Versus most business owners who, they just keep working as long as it takes, as long as it takes. They don't have a plan to get themselves out of it. That's the first thing I want you to understand. This system is a methodology to get it so the business works so you don't have to. And that's the ideal point behind it. So, let's take a look at the six steps. Each of these steps is very simple, but very, very powerful. We start down the bottom here, mastery. Well, mastery depends on which part of the world you're from. You pronounce it different ways. I say tomato, you say tomato, different things. You know, being an Australian, it's funny, my accent's understood in about half the world, and the rest of the world's going, what is he saying again? You know, but it's an interesting one. Being Australian, we understand that lifestyle is why you go into business. Being in a, being a, you know, building a business through the whole lifestyle aspect. So this mastery is where we got to start, though. We start at the basics. We've got to get the absolute fundamentals right. Now, the aim of this is to eliminate chaos in a business. How many of you ever found that uh, the business runs you, you don't run the business? Anyone in that scenario? Working too much, doing too many hours, doing that. You know, it, it's a point where we have to change change that sort of thing. So our idea is to get rid of the chaos, get rid of the putting out fires, get rid of the uh, reactive methodology of running the business and get proactive about the business where you run it, where you're actually in control of this thing. Stage two, once we've got the stability from mastery, is about cash flow. Most businesses struggle with cash flow. You know, most businesses are not making enough money to really grow at a rapid rate. If they had a lot more money come in, they could grow faster. They had the cash flow to do it. So here what we're doing is about creating a predictability of cash flow. When we say the word niche, what we're looking about here is the marketing side to your business. Now, if I ask the average business owner these two questions. First question, how many pages are currently, in fact, you might like to write it down, how many pages are in your current written documented marketing plan? Write the number down for me. It's probably a fairly round number for most of you, isn't it? You know, the reality of, of when I ask that question for most people is it's a pretty simple question, but most people don't have an answer other than zero pages or one or two pages. Why? Because they don't know how to write a marketing plan. They don't know how to do marketing. Now, here's the question. Do you want to put more money into marketing or less money into marketing? Which one? More. more. Well, you guys say more and you guys say less. Well, hang on, who's right here? The people that don't want to put money into marketing are the ones that know that every time I put money out there, it just seems to be gone. The people that actually want to make money in their marketing, they're the people that sit there and say, well, hang on, if I put more in, I get more back. That's what we want to teach you. That's what my whole book, Buying Customers, is all about. So read that book as well, which you've got to buy it first. Make sure you buy those books. Great books. Everyone should be reading all of my books. I'm a salesman first and foremost. Where are the other salespeople in the room? Okay, a couple. Let me re-ask the question. Are we all in sales, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, we're all in sales at some point, you know, and this is the thing. If you believe in what you sell, you'll sell it well. So, we have to get the niche right, the marketing. Predictable cash flow has to be a part of our business day in and day out. Then we got to go to efficiency. This is where we build in the systems within the company, the leverage. Leverage, by definition, is more with less. 
If we build in the systems, if we build in the efficiency, what it does is it buys us back our time. You know, one of the biggest challenges of business is that there's no systems in place, so therefore, you've got to work a lot of hours. You've got to do all of the extra work. There's no one else can do it. If you've ever said, or in fact, think of it this way. How many ever asked this, said this statement, um, no one can do it as good as me, or if you want a job done, you've got to do it yourself. You know, those sort of statements. Why? Because there's no systems running your business. You're running it yourself rather than using the systems to run the business, and that's a very important point. Then we get to the team side of things. Now you've got to structure a team for the growth, for the future growth. This isn't just about having people on the bus, it's about having the right people on the bus to grow the business. Because ultimately, you're not going to be running the business. If you're running the business, then it's still just a job for you. Ultimately, your goal is to get it so that the business works so you don't have to. So does that mean you're going to need better quality people, higher trained people, you know, <coughs> excuse me, people with all of the skills to grow the business, not just to keep it running. And that's an important aspect to it. This isn't about just running the business, it's about growing the business. Now, ultimately there, when we build that team into place, it's about putting someone else in charge, a CEO, a general manager, someone else to run the business on your behalf so that you can then focus on the growth side of it, the synergy. This is where you turn this thing into multiple locations. It's where you might franchise it or license it or open it across the world, open it across the state, the country, wherever it is that you want to trade. It's about looking at getting great results with the business, but it's about getting there through building the business as something that works without you and then multiplying it across different markets. Often this is where we get passive income coming in from the business. See, Ultimately, if you build the business right, it works so you don't have to. Ultimately, if you build the business to a point where it works so you don't have to, guess what? Now your income comes in whether you get out of bed or not. Imagine, like I know for me, one of my restaurants, I literally only visit the restaurant to eat or have a beer every now and again. That's it. You know, I don't go in there to run it. I don't go in there to see the management team. I don't go in to do the accounts. I don't do anything. I literally only visit. To the point where the other day I went in there with my family and my daughter came up to the front counter and the young lady on the front counter said, Hi, have you got a reservation? And my daughter looks at me, Dad, shouldn't we tell her that you own the place? I said, no, kid, that means the business is running well if they don't know we own the place. You know, that's ultimately the point. Now, you might want them to know you own the place just for fun, but... Ultimately, it's about getting a business to work so that you don't have to. So let's take a look in a little more detail about some of these areas. Once the business has got to that point, it's now time for you to go and look at other businesses. And that's a whole other aspect. If you read my billionaire in training, it's about how to buy, build, and sell companies, about what to look for. You know, that's ultimately a different game for entrepreneurs to play. Sometimes, though, you've got to get the first one running first so that you can get to the second, so you can get to the third. Number one, destination mastery. Do you need to know where you're going in order to get there, yes or no? Yes. So if I ask the average business person, and I won't put anyone on the spot in this room, but if I was to ask the average business person, show me the goals of the business, show me the, you know, where it's going, what's the vision, what's the ultimate end point of the business, where are you going, what's the goals for the next 90 days, what are the budgets for the next quarter? If I was to ask the average business owner all of those questions, what would my answer be? See, the silence of all of you is exactly what the answer is in most cases. Because most people don't have a destination written down. You know what most people have, you know, when they first started in business, they were very excited and it was like, let's go and do this and achieve that and do all these wonderful things. Now we get to a point where most of them, you know what they actually care about? Can I just pay the bills this week? You know, and that's one of the worst things. If your only goal is to just pay the bills, then guess what you're going to achieve? Just paying the bills. Nothing more than that. So make sure you understand what it is you're going, where you're going, the destination. How much easier do you think it is by finding the destination if you have a coach sitting there with you helping you decide where you're going to go, asking you the right questions about getting you there? That's what coaching does, is it has someone from the outside looking in. One of the funniest things, I know there's some husband and wife teams here in the room. When we sit with a husband and wife team and ask them, hey, what do you want out of the business and what do you want out of the business? And the two of them want two entirely different things. That, by the way, there's some interesting talks that night at home, I'm sure. But the point of it is that we help you get clarity on where you're going with the business. What are your goals? What do you want it to be valued at? What revenues do you want it to be doing? What are the profitability you need it to be doing? How many days a week do you want to work? How many vacations or what type of holidays do you want to take each year? These are important questions that you need to know for yourself 
and for your business. By the way, there's no use setting business goals and then personal goals. One of the things we always look for is, what are your personal goals and let's build a business to suit that, okay? Second area of mastery, the money side of it. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Would it be an interesting thing if I told you that, uh, well, put very simply, most people in business aren't very good at keeping a track of their numbers? Would that astound anybody? No, it wouldn't astound anybody. The challenge, though, is if you don't know your numbers, then how are we going to make any decisions? If you don't know your numbers, how do we actually grow the business? So oftentimes we've got to get people back in charge of the money of their business. Because until you're in charge of the money, how do we make decisions on how we actually will reduce an overdraft or how much stock or how much inventory we've got in the business? Which inventory is selling, which isn't? Where the highest profitability is so we know what items to sell and what items to not really focus on. You know, these are some of the aspects of it. How are you compared to industry benchmarks? marks. These are some real big challenges and some big questions that business owners need to ask. How many of you are starting to get a point here that maybe some business owners aren't acting like owners? Does, does that make sense? It's like a lot of business owners, they're acting like employees in their own business. They're so busy doing the work in the business, like I was chatting with a lady just a few weeks ago, a hairdresser. What do you think she does all day every day in her hairdressing business? Cut hair, doesn't she? So who's running the business? This is the simple question. No one's running the business. You know, she's cutting hair all day, and here's the real interesting point. She was quite upset when we discussed this because she said, Brad, I don't take home any more money than any of my staff. They take home about the same amount of pay I do. I said, well, hang on. You do the same job as them. Why do you believe you deserve more? She said, well, I own the business. I said, yeah, but you're not acting like an owner. You're acting like a hairdresser, an employee in your business. I'm going to get you doing the business side of it as well as the, as the hairdressing side. Build the business, not just the job of the business. Then we've got to look at the time area of the business. So if we want to get great productivity out of people, do we need to know how to manage time, yes or no? Yes. Guess what? You can't manage time. You can only manage people. Time doesn't stand still. There's no such thing as time management. There's really people management. So how do we actually get the highest productivity out of the employees in our organization? Basic management techniques, basic management systems, basic leadership. These are the things that need to happen in order for us to actually make the business work. If we're going to double a business, you've got one of two choices. You either double the number of people or you double the productivity. Which one's cheaper, do you think? Productivity. Productivity, way cheaper, isn't it? So that's what we've got to look for in, in this area of building the business. Then we've got to look at the delivery aspect. You know, are your customers getting their product or service on time? You know, regular delivery, is it happening well? Are they getting it with good customer service? The basics of doing it. Like, uh, I was with a restaurant owner just a few weeks back, and he's sitting there telling me how his restaurant's struggling and all this sort of thing. And I said, well, hang on, let's just watch and see how well the people are delivering or getting their product or service. So we tried some of the food in his restaurant. You've all seen those TV shows where they fix restaurants. What's one of the biggest problems? The chef thinks they got great food, but what do the customers think? Not great food. You know, so that basics of delivery, whether it's about time of delivery, level of service, how it's doing, we've got to get that stuff happening as well. Once you've got those four areas there, now it's time to move to marketing. Why wouldn't we move to marketing before that? This is a really tough question for some people. If you do marketing before you know your numbers, does that make any sense? No, what are we doing? Selling more of stuff that we're not making a profit on? Doesn't make sense to do that stuff. So we're going to then move to the, to the thing. So when we look at it, we call it a niche. Now, what's my definition of a niche? That there's no what competition? Everyone know? Price. So what's the, what's the deal with that? Why are most businesses competing on price? Because there's nothing unique about them. There's nothing different about those businesses. If they don't have a uniqueness, what do they got to compete on? Price. But that being said, how simple is it for a business to stop selling on price? Well, let's, let's do this. You call, let's say you're calling someone to buy new tires for your car, okay? You call them up, want new tires for your car. What's the first question you're going to ask? How much? How much for price? What's the price for tires for this type of car? And if they just give you the price, what is the only thing you have to make a decision on right now? Price. So we've got to teach people how to not focus on price. We've got to teach salespeople. We've got to teach the marketers how to focus on value, how to focus on things. What's one of the fastest ways you can kill a business? It starts with D. 
Discounting, correct. The moment you start discounting, you're starting to kill a business. You know, too often, and especially in small to medium-sized companies, when they start thinking discounting, they start actually losing business hand over fist because, well, here's the thing. When you discount, what type of customer do you attract? Cheap. Someone that wants cheap prices. Will there always be another business that's willing to offer cheap prices, yes or no? Always going to happen. So our aim in the niche segment is now how do we define a great set of customers? What are we looking for? And of course we don't just want them to come in once, we want them to come back again and again. So this is where we have to look at how do we actually do that. So when I go in and start talking about growing a company, there's three areas that most people focus on with me. They say, Brad, you know, we need more customers. Brad, we need more revenues. Or Brad, we need more profitability. I'm going to show you a formula in a moment that shows you those three things are actually not important in a business. Why are they not important? Well, very simply, when you see the, uh, the formula I'm about to teach you, they are just the end result of another five areas. And these five areas are the most important five areas in business. Yet, when I ask the average business owner what this formula looks like, they have no idea. So, if you haven't taken great notes to now, this one you want to really write down very well. My first book, Instant Cash Flow, had a whole bunch of information on this, but you've got to know this formula. So, the formula works like this. Number of leads. Leads is like uh, prospects, potential customers. They could call your business. You could call them. Uh, they could come over the internet. They could walk into your store. However it is you communicate with customers. So number of prospects or leads. We then multiply that by your conversion rate. That is the percentage of those that could have bought the, to the percentage of those that actually do. So 10 people called your business today and only two of them made a purchase. Your conversion rate is 2 out of 10 or 20%. Now, if you don't know those numbers, how do you improve them? Any, any sports fans in the room? How many stats do they keep in sport? All of the stats. Why do they want to know their numbers? How come? So they can get better. If you don't know your numbers, it's very hard to get better. So I ask you, how many of you in this room know how many leads came into your business last week? Like how many actual people called you, walked in, whatever they do in your business? Who knows that number and knows it accurately? Okay, see, that's the problem that we don't know the number, how are we going to improve it? Now, my coaches, I've taught all of my coaches 87 different ge lead generation strategies. So there's 87 different methodologies to bring leads into a business. Average business, how many different ways do they have leads coming in, do you think? Five. Five? Any other guesses? One or two, that's far more like it. One or two strategies to bring in leads. Do you think you can have a growth business with only one or two strategies to bring in leads? Not happening, is it? Uh, and again, this comes back to my marketing question. Why aren't people putting more money into marketing? Because usually their marketing is done badly, therefore they, you know, they put money into a radio advertisement, it ran 10,000, whatever number of times, and they said that radio doesn't work. And it's not that radio doesn't work, it's that that, ba that advertisement run on that station at that time with that offer, that headline, and that voiceover didn't work. A lot of variables to look at in this thing. So then conversion rate. We have 83 different strategies to improve the conversion rate of a business. And we're going to get to how to do some of these in a moment. But the point behind it is this. What you've got to look for in each and every one of these is do you know the numbers and do you have a plan to improve them? You know, because when we start with you, one of the first things we're going to do is find out what are these numbers. And then we're going to say, okay, we're going to look at how much we have to improve them to hit your goals. Then we've got a plan. You see, you sit down and start thinking about it. If you know your numbers are here and they've got to get there, we can design a plan to actually make that happen for your business. So then we're going to look at number of transactions. Now, this is about repeat business, how often a customer buys from you over and over again. Now, some customers will come in once, you'll never, ever see them again. Other customers will come in 10, 20 times a year. But this is about the average number of times the average customer comes in per year to buy from you. Now, again, we've got to get them coming back more often. Then we've got the average dollar sale. You know, and we sit down and we look at it and we say, okay, what is the average sale in this scenario? How much are people actually spending? Now, some will spend five, some 500, but what's the average is what we're looking for in this case. Again, let's develop a plan to change that. Then we've got the margins, okay? What is the profitability of this in this example? That's what we're looking for. Of course, we want to improve that. Now, if your revenues go up, will your profit margins go up? Yeah, because your cost coverage is already done. 
But on top of that, we got another 50 odd strategies to improve the bottom line profitability of a business. And not just cutting costs. This is not the only way to improve margins. A lot of marketing things will improve margins. For example, ask Ralph Lauren how much he charges for a polo shirt versus going down to your local store and buying one there. You know, marketing does help margins. It helps the amount we charge for something, so therefore it works. So let's put some numbers into this so you can get an idea of it. I'm going to go pretty quickly with the numbers, but just help you understand. So let's pretend last year we had 4,000 potential customers. You might like to write these down so you can actually work it through. 4,000 potential customers. Let's pretend we sold to one in four of them, okay? So only one in four actually made a purchase. So you've got how many customers in this case? 25% conversion rate, 1,000 customers. Does that make sense for everyone so far? Okay. Second one then, we've got to look at the next part of this, transactions. Number of transactions, how often you get them back. Let's give in this example two times a year. So again, some people never came back, others came back 10 or 12 times, but the average person bought twice. Then let's use the average sale and say it's 100. Just for ease of numbers sake, here's 100. So you've got 1,000 customers doing two transactions at 100 a time, so what's your revenue? 2,000 transactions at 100, 200,000 in revenue for this little business. So then we're going to do margins. I'm going to make it easy for you and just say let's do 25% margins, okay? So it's easy math. So this business's profitability is 50 grand. Now, why do you see I've got those three numbers highlighted in red? The, re the customers, the revenue, and the profitability. Why do you think I've highlighted those? They're most important. The most important? Absolutely not. <laughs> in fact, the exact opposite to that is the answer. They are the three least important ones. Why are they the least important numbers on that page? They're the outputs. <laughs> They're the outputs. They're the result. Remember I said that a moment ago. They're the end result. The equal sign is in front of them. So the five numbers we actually need to know, the five numbers we actually want to work on are leads, conversion, transactions, average sale, and... Profit margins, okay? So these are the things that we've got to look at in a business. Now, at Action Coach, we have an advantage over most people because we have like 80 here, 80 here, 60 strategies, sorry, 70 odd strategies there, 60 odd strategies there, and another 50 odd strategies there. So all up 280 odd strategies to improve the bottom line that, to work with business. How many of those strategies most business owners know? Very few. Why? They're hairdressers. They're cutting hair all day. Yeah, you know, they're not focused on this stuff. This is where we've got to get you to focus. But it takes the mastery area first, getting the basics done right. Then we move to the niche to take care of the cash flow. Just let's look at each of these areas if we could do a 10% increase in them. Now, most of the time we can grow your business a lot faster than you can grow it. Why do we have to go slower with our marketing than what you can, ha what you can do? Two reasons. Number one, cash. Does it take money to grow a business fast, yes or no? How many of you have had that problem where you've grown too fast and you started to run out of cash and you're like, hang on, we've got to slow down a bit because we can't put enough stock or we can't hire enough people or we can't open a new office or you, know, you couldn't afford to grow at that speed? What's the second reason we have to grow a little slower for most companies? Think about it. Money and ability to deliver. deliver. See, the ability to deliver is another thing. If you get too many customers too fast, could that put you out of business just as fast? Yes or no? Your service levels go down, your reputation goes down, things don't happen the way they should, you know, it ends up being a problem. So, sometimes we can grow a little faster, most of the time we've got to go a bit slower in the beginning so that we can get you up to speed and then we can grow real fast. So in this example, I'm only going to do 10% in each area. So let's imagine we worked on four or five different strategies over 12 months. We tested them, we learned what works, we measured them, we got results, we knew what was happening, and we could increase your lead flow by 10%. Now, by the way, for most of you, increasing your lead flow by 10% is as simple as actually measuring where they're coming from right now. One client of mine, this guy spent a lot of money on marketing. He was about 80 grand a month. We started measuring where his leads were actually coming from. We found that only 30,000 of his 80,000 was bringing him in leads. The other 50 grand was bringing no new customers for his business. How fast do you think he stopped spending that 50 grand every month and put it where the 30 grand was and what happened to his business? Two and a half times the number of leads because he put the money where it was supposed to go, not where it wasn't performing. Measuring your numbers is real important. We've got to know them. But just doing that won't work for everyone. For the rest of you, that's why we have another 70-odd strategies for you to actually get to work on to build the business. So in this case, 4,000 becomes what, gang? Call it out for me. 4,400. Not a big increase, but it's very powerful. Let's work our way through. Then we've got to work your conversion rate. 
Again, just measuring it alone. How many of you know your conversion right now? Like down to the decimal point, you know that if 20 people call, we sell this many. Who knows that number in their business? One or two of you, fantastic. The rest of you, you got a lot of room for growth if you don't know it, because whatever you guess it is, it's about half that, okay? Most of the time, in fact, I worked with one guy, a big electrical company, a big electrician, lots of vans out on the road with guys doing electrical work in all of these different places. Here's this guy, he says to me, Brad, we're great at sales, we sell 70 or 80% of people that call. I said, fantastic. Two weeks later, we'd measured it for two weeks. Two weeks later, I came back to visit and I sat down with him and said, how's the conversion rate? And he was very upset. I think, in fact, he was ready to fire all of his staff at that point in time because he was spending a lot of money on advertising and bringing leads into the business, but they were only converting 17%. Now you think about that, that means more than four out of five leads are just burned. When they call up, they don't, make, they don't convert them into a sale. We've got to measure it. But then again, we've got another 80 odd strategies to improve the conversion rate. So if we took a year, do you think we could get 10% better in your conversion rate? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, especially if we measured it and knew what was happening and did all those things. So in this case, 10% more than 25 is what, everybody? So, sorry, hang on. This one here, the 25%, not 35, it's 10% better. I don't want 10% more, just 10% better. I should have worded that properly. So in this case, we go to 27 and a half. So I've already done the math for you. That gives you 1,210 customers, 1,210 customers in this case. Then we're going to work on your repeat business. Now, simplest one of all of repeat business. How many of you, raise your hand if you've done this. Did every customer you've done business with in the last month even, just the last month, get sent a note that said, hey, thanks for buying from us. We really appreciate you buying. Who's done that? Okay, again, room for improvement here, gang. Lots of room for growth. My challenge with each and every one of you is that all of these things have got to happen if you want the business to grow. Give you a simple example. One company sent me a beautiful thank you card. It was a restaurant. I ended up becoming their best customer because my waiter sent me a handwritten note saying, hey, thanks for buying from us. We really appreciate it. Love to see you back again soon. If you need another booking, please call me. Your waiter, Phil. He became known to me as Lucky Phil, because that guy got good tips. But the point of it is, what are you doing to get your past customers back? How many of your past customers have ever said to you, hey, I didn't know you sold that, or I didn't know you could do that? Lots of them. Why? Because they don't know what else to buy from you. In fact, how many of you at least have a database, a, a list of all of your past customers, their names and addresses and emails? There must be a bunch of you with that. Okay, great. Keep your hand up if you still write to them at least every 90 days and ask them to come back and buy more often. Keep your hand up if you do that. Okay, so most of you are not doing that. What, you've just spent all that money getting that new customer, getting them to come to you. Doesn't it make sense to know their name and address and get them to come back more often? So even if all we did was 10% better. By the way, I was in uh, where was it? Ireland. In the north of Ireland, this guy raised his hand. He said, Brad, can't possibly get more repeat business out of my customers. And I said, why is that? And he said, because I'm in the funeral business. <laughs> it's like, okay, buddy, yeah, you got me, you got me. But... Actually, I got him back because I said to him, hang on a sec, who's the customer, the dead person or the family? He said, well, the family. I said, good, any of them ever going to die? He says, yes, it's good, keep in touch with them. <laughs> um, you know, actually, I had a realtor argue with me. I was just up in uh, Milwaukee, and this realtor said to me, well, Brad, hang on a second. If I write back to my customers, it's not worth it. They only buy a new house every three to seven years. I said, well, hang on, let's do the math. I'm suggesting you write back to them every 90 days. That's four times a year. What's it cost to send a letter? You know, a dollar, a pound, a euro, wherever you are in the world, it's going to cost you like one. So here we are, four dollars a year, seven years, $28. Is that a pretty good investment to get a customer back? Yeah, and this is the challenge I have with a lot of business people. They spend all the money trying to get new customers and forget. What about keeping the past ones coming back? So, number of transactions, in this case we go from 2 to just 2.2, 10% better. Then we're going to work your average dollar sale. This one's pretty easy. If you just measure this one, it will go up. Or you do the McDonald's lesson. What does McDonald's ask you? You go and order a burger and they say, would you like fries with that? You know, they ask you if you want the fries, and three out of ten people say yes to that question. I was working with a group of lawyers, and lawyers are real funny, teaching them sales. And here I am teaching sales to lawyers, and I'm like, well, what's your would you like fries with that question? And they're like, I don't know, I'm not sure, da, da, da. In the end, I said, listen, why wouldn't you just ask it? Well, actually, let's do a test. Raise your hand in this room right now if you either don't have a will or the will you have needs updating. Raise your hand if you're in that category. What do we got? 50, 60% of the room. 
So I said to this group of, t of lawyers, why wouldn't you just ask everyone, by the way, does your will need updating? One guy takes me seriously. His firm made millions of dollars that year by asking that silly little insidious question. You know, you've got to understand though, these are strategies that work if you work them. The problem for most businesses is that the business owner is so busy doing this and doing that and putting out fires and taking care of things that we don't get across the line of doing this stuff. So even if, in fact, one of the biggest strategies or the simplest strategies to improve your average dollar sale, guess what it is? Raise your prices. You know, most business owners, in fact, who's the most scared person in any business to raise their prices? The owner is always the most scared person. How come they think, oh, I'll lose a customer? Da, da, da. Look, the reality of business is very few customers are solely focused on price. Most customers are focused on value. So we've got to look at that sort of thing. How can you add value to them rather than discount, rather than try and be the cheapest? How can you actually get good quality customers that will buy long term? So in this case, we're going to work on your average sale. If any of those ones don't work, we've still got another 60-odd strategies to improve the average dollar sale in your business. So if I over 12 months we work on this, do you think 10% increase is pretty reasonable, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, so we got 10% increase there. So of course what we've done is increase the revenues by 10%, haven't we? Yep. Haven't we? Yep. Yes. Thank you. No, <laughs> tricked you. It's actually not 10%. It's 10% times 10% times 10% times 10%. That gives us a 292,820 in revenues in this business. That's a 46% increase in the revenue because of the multiplying factor in this, in this example. See, and then we've got to, and, and where are my accountants again? If we had a 46% increase in revenue, has profits gone up? Yes, they have. But let's pretend we had to use some of the other 50 strategies to improve the, the profit of margin in this business. And that takes us just 10% better again, 27 and a half. Now now we've got a take home of $80,525.50. That's 61% improvement in the bottom line of the business. How, I mean, actually, how many of you would like a 61% improvement in your bottom line in the next 12 months? Say yeah? yeah. In fact, how many of you would like to have a bottom line in the next 12 months? Anyone in that category? You know, it's one of these things, gang, that when we sit down and look at it, if we're so busy cutting hair or whatever your business does, we don't work on this stuff. And by not working on it, we, we have the problems. Now, what if your business could do 15% in each area? Or up to 20% or 10 in some areas, 15 or 20 in other areas? What would be the improvement in your business over the next 12 months? So can you understand how coaching pays for itself? See, at Action Coach, we're one of the only coaching companies in the world that A, we do business in 53 countries around the world, but B, not only that, we guarantee what we do because we pay for ourselves by using these strategies. So that's what happens in your business when we do this stuff. Now, once we've got the niche worked out, then we've got to get to the systems, the leverage aspect of the business. Remember our definition of a business, a commercial profitable enterprise, that's what the marketing does. Now when we get into this side, it's a commercial profitable enterprise that works, okay? This is where the systems come into the business. We've actually now got a systemize. Why do we want to do systems, by the way, after marketing? Because systems cost money. If you don't have good marketing in place, you're not making enough money to pay for the systems to be developed. And also, you don't have enough volume to really need the systems in place in most cases. So, let's take a little uh, look at systems. Um, when we sit down and take a look at it, most of the time with systems, what we're thinking about is a very simple premise. System stands for, I'll get you all to read it out for me, everyone. Save yourself time, energy, and money. I fell in love with writing systems in a business back when I had a photocopy shop. And I thought, hang on, I'm working too hard. And I started writing systems, started documenting how things could be done. And not in any complex way. It's not like I was doing ISO 9000 or anything. I was just writing down how things should be done. I was taking pictures of how things should look, doing videos of how things should be done, audio taping how things should be said. And hey presto, I started developing systems. And what I really learned is that if you've got systems for things, A, does it take you less time to train someone when it's written down how to do it? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. B, I'd stopped having to say things like, if you want the job done right, do it yourself. Because other people could do the job right, because guess what? They had a system to do it. 
It wasn't as complex as that. Now, I wrote a book called Instant Systems. It's one of the 15 books uh, that you'll be able to read through us with Action Coach. What we go through here is how we actually structure that systems in a business. Now, we start here with a vision statement. Where is the business ultimately going? This isn't about your basic goals. This is about the big picture of the business. Where do we want the business to go? Then we write a mission statement, and that really designs how do we actually get there? You know, the vision is the big thing in the future. Future, but the mission tells us this is the road we're going to take to get to the vision. Third thing we want to put on is a culture statement. Now, you can call these a company's core values, the core beliefs, you can call it a culture, whatever it is. But we actually want to write down the rules of the game in our business. We actually want to write down what is our business rules? How do we want to play this game called business? Now, why do we want to do that? Because if we're going to put systems in, we're going to hire great people, we need to have a great system for them to operate within. If you're stuck for what that should look like, jump on our website, actioncoach.com, take a look at our 14 points of culture. You'll start to get an idea as to what we're talking about here. Then we need to set goals, and SMART goals, of course, specific, measurable, achievable, results oriented with a time frame. Okay, so SMART goal setting. We want to set goals for our business for the next 90 days, we want to set it for the next year, the next two, three, four, five years. Now, a lot of people struggle with setting, setting goals because they don't really know where you're going. First of all, though, we start with setting goals at the smallest end. We start with doing it on a daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly basis. Then we can stretch to annual goals, then we can stretch. Too often I see people say, well, you know, you've got to set a five-year goal and then you can work backwards. Well, a lot of businesses struggle to set a five-year goal because, hey, that's a long way off in the future. I really don't know where I'm going to be next week. How the heck do you expect me to know where I'm going to be in five years' time? So then we go through and we say, all right, now we're going to develop an organization chart. What should the org chart look like? When you're going to finish this business, when this business is going to be achieving its vision, what is the organization going to look like? What sort of positions are you going to have in the company? Where is the company going to be and how is it going to look? Developing an organization chart is a lot easier said than done. A lot of people sit down to try and do it and they work out, well, how many people should I have there? Should I have someone in marketing? Should I have, how many salespeople should I have ultimately? So sometimes that takes a bit of coaching to help get through that one. Then we've got to have contracts for each position. Now, by the way, I see you're all looking so excited about writing these positional contracts, aren't you? It's not as hard as what you think it is. In fact, it actually gets quite easy once you know what you're doing with this stuff. Developing positional contracts, does that allow your employees to do a better job, yes or no? If they know what they're supposed to be doing, how they're supposed to be doing it, and how they're going to be measured and remunerated, the clearer they know their job, the easier it is to do their job and the higher their performance levels are, and obviously the higher your profitability is. Then we go to key performance indicators. Every position, every department, every part of the company needs to have some sort of a measurement to say, this is how we know when you're doing a good job. This is how we know when you're performing at a high level. We've got to measure those things. Then the how-to part of the system. Notice we haven't got to the how-tos until point nine in this. This is why most companies, when they go to put systems in place, they fail because they haven't done the groundwork to get the systems to work. What's the use of writing a system if someone doesn't know it's their job to do that part of the system? What's the use of having a how-to manual on something if someone doesn't realize where it fits within the organization chart? Yeah, these are some of the important aspects of writing systems that come first, so ultimately we can get to those how-to systems. And then finally we develop management systems. You know, a lot of the time when people want to leave their business, the reason they can't leave is there's no other management in place. If we develop great management systems, great reporting systems, great meetings, great ways of managing our people, Ultimately, we get a phenomenal job happening through those systems. So finally, then, we want to get to the team side of it. So remember back to our definition of a business. Business is a commercial, profitable enterprise that works, guess what? Without, Without you. Without me, okay, in my, in my case. So when we sit down and we start thinking about getting this business to work without us, that means it's got to work with other people. So what quality of team do you want to build? High quality team. So to do that, do we need to learn recruiting, yes or no? Yeah, yeah we've got to learn how to recruit the best people. And here's the funny thing about most people when it comes to recruiting. Most people just put a help-wanted ad out there and they hope that the right people will actually come to it. That might have worked 20 years ago, it doesn't work today. Hiring and recruiting the greatest people is about understanding. See, back to my sports people again in the room. How much time, energy and effort do sporting teams put into actually recruiting the best people? How much? 
Massive amounts. Why? By the way, are they looking for people that are cut from the team already? Are they looking for people without a job? No, they're only looking for what? People that already have jobs. See, the best employees come from other companies. The best employees already have jobs. So you've got to learn how to recruit, not just how to write a help wanted ad. It's a very big part of building a great team. But you've also got to learn management. You've also got to learn leadership. See, again, the learning work is the hardest work of business ownership. It's pretty easy to do the work. The cutting hair stuff, dead easy. Learning how to grow the business, learning the sales, the marketing, the management, the leadership, that stuff's hard. It takes time to learn it. But that's our job as business coaches, to help you learn this stuff. So when you look at building a team, we do it in a simple format. As the owner of the business or the head of the business, the CEO of the business, your job is to take care of your team. Your team's job is to take care of the customers, the customer's job to take care of the business, and the business job to take care of you as the owner. Now, in most scenarios, the owner's taking care of how many of these three things? All of them. The owner's taking care of the business, the customers, the team. They're running themselves ragged trying to do it. If instead the owner builds great systems, the owner helps build productivity into the company, invests in the future, does the thing, does the planning, does the owner's work. So you've got to remember, I want you doing business owner's work, not just employee's work within your company. So once you start doing owner's work, you, you build your team. Your team's job then is to take care of the customers. And here's a real interesting fact. The level of relationship between the owner of the business or the CEO and the team is directly proportional to guess what? The relationship between the team and the customers. If the relationship between the owner and the team is good, then the team will take care of the customers. If the customers are being taken care of by the team, guess what they'll take a lot of care of? The business, by coming back, spending more, referring more people, and doing a lot of business with you. So we've got to get it to that point. Ultimately, then, that takes care of the owner. So team building is a major part of business success. Now, why do we do it after systems? Why do we do the basics first? Because we need the basics to be right before we do any marketing. Why do we then do marketing? Because we need money to pay for the systems. We also need the systems to make it more efficient before we go and hire more team, before we build the team. What's the use of building a team if you've got a lack of efficiency in the business? We want efficiency, we want a good system, and then we go and build a great team. Does that make sense to everyone so far? So then we go to the synergy and results part of this thing. This is where you start the duplication. This is where your freedom kicks in. This is where your personal growth and you can get to do other opportunities and stuff. Up until here, where we get to team, what we're doing is buying back your time. We're making the extra money to hire the better people, to build the better system, so that you can actually work less. Most of you understand this very, you know, it's very simple. If you had better systems and better people, would you be working less, yes or no? Yes. You have better marketing, better systems and better team, would you be making more money? Yes. Absolutely. If you've got better mastery, the basics of the business, are you having to put out less fires and being more proactive? Yes. See, the first part of working with a coach is fixing the basics of the business, this mastery aspect down here. Once you've got the basics fixed, then it's time to do the fun stuff, you know? And sometimes fixing it'll take a month or two. Sometimes it takes six, 12, even, even 18 months to get a business fixed. It depends on how badly you've messed it up, I guess, determines how long it takes to do that. Now, ultimately, then we go to the niche, and that could take three, six, 12 months. It could even take two years to get the marketing stuff right. Depends on how good your marketing is today and where you're at with it today. But then we go on to the systemization. Again, another three to six months, depending upon where you're at. Maybe bigger if you're in a bigger business. And then we go to the team building. Again, another three to six months. It takes time to do this stuff. A lot of people think that, hey, I can, I'm looking for the silver bullet in business. I'm looking for that one idea that's going to save the whole thing. The reality of business is that you don't double a business with one idea. One idea doesn't add 100%. But 100 ideas that add 1%, this is how you double a business. It's the small changes along the way. This little small change, this little small change, they add up to massive change within the business. So Richard Branson, probably one of the most famous entrepreneurs worldwide, the Virgin Brands, all of these things, he said it very, very simply. If I can, and this is the thing, what if I teach you how to run one business, can you then go and buy another business and do it again? If I teach you how to run a business, you can run as many of them as you want. You can run bigger ones than the one you're currently running. You can add zeros and upgrade to a bigger business, a better business than the one you're in.
You know, but it's the learning of how to run the business that is what takes the time. The challenge is we didn't all have different jobs. We didn't have jobs in sales and marketing and all of these things to be trained by other people how to run our business. So we had to learn it along the way. One of my greatest mentors, Jim Rohn, a very, very smart man. I was 16 years of age when I went to his first ever seminar. and pretty sure it changed the course of my life in the Brisbane City Town Hall. And I was sitting there as a 16-year-old, probably the youngest person in the room, taking notes hand over fist. But the two things that he said that stood out to me most, number one, he said, never wish your life were easier, wish that you were better. See, don't wish business was easier, Get, become a better business person. You know, don't wish that this thing is going to change because it's not. It's just going to get harder and harder if you keep going down the same road. The reality of business is that the reason businesses keep disappearing is that the owners don't keep learning how to change and grow with the way the market is. Is business getting easier or harder out there? Which one, gang? Harder. There's more and more people wanting to compete with you. The economy gets tougher and tougher. There's more red tape. There's often more taxes, all of this sort of stuff. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it though. It means we should learn how to do it better and how to do it more effectively. Second thing Jim Rohn said, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Now I translate that to work harder on yourself than you do on your business. See, if you become a better business person, what all of a sudden happens? You build a better business. It's not rocket science, gang. This is a pretty easy way that we need to actually think about it. Building a business is not that hard if you know how. The challenge is how you're going to learn it. You're going to read all the books, are you going to go and do courses? Most of you don't have the time for that. But do you have time to meet with a coach every week? Do you have time to have someone work with you every single week? For most of us, the answer is yes. You know, I put it very, very simply. Where you get to in five years' time depends on the people you meet, the books you read, and the action you take. If you want to do the best decision you can, make a big decision. Take a big step. But working through the six steps is a very clear, systematic methodology. You know what a lot of business owners find when I show them the six steps? For the first time, they now actually have a plan how to get their business to work without them. For the first time, they now actually know how to make the business work so they don't have to. That's ultimately the goal. That's where we want you to get to, and that's why I started Action Coach. Hopefully you'll join us, and hopefully you'll understand how, how powerful these systems are for growing your business. Thanks, everyone.